Okay, so I'd like to um, welcome everyone for the second seminar of this semester. And um, our speaker today is Erica Flappen, who is currently uh, director uh, of the notices in Boston. And she's going to tell us about topological and geometric symmetries of molecules. So, well, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And this is the first time I've done this, so hopefully it will work well. Um, I am going to talk about topological and geometric symmetries of molecules, as Sarah pointed out. This is really not in the field of algebraic topology, but it is uh, topology, more geometric than algebraic. So, so I want to begin by talking about uh, molecular symmetries and why they're important. So when an uh, organic chemist synthesizes a new molecule, the molecule is too small to see in a microscope. So how do they know that it is what they claim it is, that it has the form of what they claim it has? So one example of, of this is that uh, chemists wanted to synthesize a molecule in the form of a Mobius strip, but made out of a ladder. And they started by having a ladder, which we can see on the screen. Here is my pointer. Uh, with three rungs, and what they wanted to do is join the two ends of the ladder with a half twist, as we would when we're constructing a Mobius strip. And they claimed that they did that. They claimed that the, the molecule formed and that it, it formed with a half twist just as they wanted. But the problem was, how did they know that's the way it formed? Maybe it formed without a half twist, just a, with a straight, uh, straight gluing. And the molecules were too small to see with a microscope or even with an electron micrograph. It's much, much smaller than DNA. So how could they know that the ladders joined with a half twist as they wanted to say it did? So what they did is they had to use experimental data because uh, they can't use, they can't see it. And so they observed because of the um, behavior of the molecule that the molecule was distinct from its mirror image. And, uh, and they detected this by the way that it um, uh, turns polarized light. So in any case, so they knew the molecule was distinct from its mirror image, and they observed that if the latter was joined without a twist, then it would be the same as its mirror image. As you can see in this first image here, that if you have a straight ring, the mirror, this, this funny thing in the center is the mirror, is going to be, the mirror image is going to be exactly the same. Um, but how do we know that if we have a twisted ladder, as we have in the lower pictures in red, that it's actually different from its mirror image? So, so looking at it, it seems different from its mirror image, and it's known that if you have a strip, it's different whether you twist it to the right or you twist it to the left. You get a Mobius ladder, a Mobius strip, which is different from its mirror image. But it actually required quite a bit of topological machinery to prove that the twisted ladder is different from its mirror image. And I'm not going to go into that. That was done by John Simon at the University of Iowa using techniques from knot theory, in fact. But in any case, at this point, they, they could conclude that the molecule they had was different from its mirror image and therefore couldn't be just a straight strip where the two ends are glued without a twist. But in addition to this, when they were looking at the um, experimental data about the symmetries of the molecule, what they observed is uh, the, that the molecule had what they called a six-fold symmetry. And they, they found this using NMR data. And if we want to visualize a six-fold symmetry of this molecule, what I'm doing in the pictures here is rather than having all of the carbons, which are indicated by corners, and oxygens indicated by O's, and the double bars, which are carbon-carbon double bonds. I'm just going to draw it more simply with a purple around the edge and red to indicate the carbon-carbon double bonds. And I should say that while the um, purple and the red are chemically certainly different, the numbers that I have, the number one versus the number two, are, don't have any particular chemical meaning. They're just to help us understand this, this six-fold symmetry that I'm going to describe to you. So in the first picture, we replace our, our molecular structure by this purple and red structure. And now what we want to do is we want to rotate it 
so that the rung 1, 4 goes into the position where 2, 5 was. And you can see that in the second picture here, that indeed 1, 4 is moved to where 2, 5 was, and so on. However, in rotating it, the twist that was in front originally is now on the side. And so this is not yet a symmetry because in order for it to be a symmetry, the, the molecule has to go back to the exact same position it was, even though the vertices will have moved. And so in order to get it back to, so that it looks exactly like the original, we just take the twist and we move it to the front. You can imagine sort of twisting along the ladder to make that twist move from the side to the front. So what we see is that the picture we started with, with the numbers, and the picture we end up with is, is exactly the same, except the numbers are in a different position. And you can also observe one went to two, went to three, et cetera, that if we do this six times, we'll get back to the original position of every single vertex. So this is indeed a six-fold symmetry. And this cannot occur as a rigid motion of the molecule in S3, in R3, excuse me. In fact, if you think in terms of S3, which is not the world of chemistry, then you could have this as a rigid motion in S3 because it would be a glide rotation. But in any case, in R3, where the chemists are living, the, um, this symmetry cannot be seen as a rigid motion. So this is important because um, let me say one more thing. It is important because of the fact that this is telling me that the NMR data is detecting a non-rigid motion, because this motion can't be done rigidly. So, so as I said before, chemists use this experimental symmetry data to understand the shape of a molecule they've synthesized, and what they typically do is they'll compare the experimental data to the symmetries of a rigid molecule, a rigid model, and if the rigid model has the same symmetries that they see on their NMR data, then they'll conclude that the, that the molecule indeed has the form of the model. However, if in fact NMR is detecting non-rigid symmetries, as we see for this six-fold symmetry, then that means it isn't sufficient to compare the symmetries that the NMR detects with the symmetries of a rigid molecule, a rigid model of the molecule. So, so this is an important distinction between whether you're looking at symmetries of a rigid model or symmetries of the actual molecule. And in order to understand this a little better, I'm going to talk some more about the difference between rigid and non-symmetry, rigid symmetries but uh, in the context of mirror symmetry, which is a little simpler than like six-fold symmetry. So, Erica, could I, could I interrupt yeah. you with a yes. question? Yes, so, I'll go back. Uh, first question, do you, do you know um, a molecule that they form in a Mobius band uh, like this? Uh, do, do you know an example of, of what such a molecule is, is used for or why they make a uh, Mobius band? Actually, so, so I'm going to get to that later, but oh, I'll okay. get, if you're willing to wait, then you'll see I can wait. later. Uh, so, so let me just say now that the Mobius ladder itself didn't have any specific applications, but the concepts that this is related to do, and we'll get to that later. And then another question, what, what is an NMR machine, or what does it stand it's, for? It's a machine that analyzes the symmetries of molecules. Okay. It, it, like, I can't tell you how it works, sorry. Okay, okay, cool, thank you. Um, nuclear magnetic resonating, resonating, something like that. Okay. So in any case, so now let's look at a little more about the distinction between rigid and non-rigid symmetries in the context of mirror image symmetry. So I want to introduce a word that people who haven't seen it before tend to get confused about. So I'm going to spend a little more time on the word than I might normally. So we're going to say that a molecule is chemically achiral if on a chemical level, it can change into its mirror image. And otherwise, we say it's chemically chiral. So the reason I want to emphasize the fact that people get confused about this is because everyone is used to, you add the letter A in front of a word to mean not. Like you can say, Susie is political, John is apolitical, meaning John is not political, doesn't care about politics. 
So this definition seems backwards when you first encounter it, and that may have a tendency to make people confuse the words achiral and chiral. But in order to avoid this confusion, I want to introduce the etymology of this word. And in fact, the word comes from the ancient Greek word for hand, because a left hand can't change into a right hand. So you know, no matter what you do with one hand, it can't turn into the other hand. Um, and so the idea is that we're saying that a molecule is chemically chiral if it has the sort of positive property of being like a hand. And it's achiral if it does not have the property of being like a hand. So whenever you can't remember which one is which, just remember that chiral is like a hand. So the other thing I want to emphasize here is that this definition is a description of the behavior of a molecule which is why I'm putting the, the adjective chemically in before, before the word, because this is not a mathematical definition that we're all used to. It's a property of a molecule. So we're going to look at different types of chirality and have different adjectives in front. Okay, so first let's look at sort of the mathematical definition that chemists most closely associate with chemical achirality or chemical chirality and that is rigid achirality. So we're gonna say that a molecule is rigidly achiral if, as a rigid object, it's exactly the same as its mirror image. Maybe you have to turn it or look at it from a different angle, but as a physical object, it's exactly the same as its mirror image. And if it's not exactly the same as its mirror image as a rigid object, we say it's rigidly chiral. Again, chiral is like a hand. So, so we can see that we have the implication that if a molecule is rigidly achiral, meaning it's the same as its mirror image as a rigid object, then chemically it's achiral because, because chemically it's identical to its mirror image, so it can change into its mirror image by not doing anything. Um, so we have this implication. Okay. Now, I can also rephrase these definitions in terms of chirality rather than achirality. So we say a molecule is chemically chiral if it cannot change into its mirror form, and it's uh, rigidly chiral if, as a rigid object, it is not the same as its mirror form. And so we have the implication chemically chiral implies rigidly chiral, but really the question is, what about the reverse? And often chemists assume that these definitions are equivalent. And that's what they're doing by using their rigid models to understand the symmetry properties of a molecule. So we're going to show that this is not the case, that the, these are not equivalent definitions, and in fact, that there's a rigidly chiral molecule, which is chemically achiral. But in fact, we're going to prove something a little stronger than that. Um, and this is a definition that was introduced by chemists to sort of as a challenge as to whether such a thing could exist. So we say a molecule is a Euclidean rubber glove if it's chemically chiral, uh, sorry, chemically achiral, chemically it can change into its mirror image, but chemically it's impossible for it to change into a position which is rigidly achiral. So, so why do we call this, I, I have a rubber glove in my drawer, um, so why do we call this a Euclidean rubber glove? So first of all, why do we use the word rubber glove? Well, so I take a rubber glove. These days, rubber gloves are actually ambidextrous, so I drew a heart on my palm. As you can see, there's no heart on the back of my hand, so that makes this a right-handed rubber glove because it has a heart on the palm of the right hand. And if I put it on my left hand, the heart would be on the back. Except, in fact, this, this uh, rubber glove can turn into a left-handed rubber glove by turning it inside out. So that's what I just did. I turned it inside out. You can see the part through the, through the glove. The back doesn't have one. So, so this is an example. This rubber glove is an example of a molecule. It's actually an object which can change into its mirror form but which actually can't get into a position where it's identical to its mirror form. 
So, so even while I'm changing it from one to another, I'm turning it inside out. It's at no point along the way is that identical to its mirror image. And so the reason it's called, that explains why it's called a rubber glove. Why it's called Euclidean is because chemists are using the word Euclidean to mean geometric, because Euclid discovered geometry, and then we're using the word geometry to refer to rigid properties. So that's why this is called the Euclidean rubber glove. So the questions, the question that um, Van Gulik, who, who defined a Euclidean rubber glove, was asking is whether there could be such a molecule, which is, again, chemically achiral, but it can't get into a position where you could see the achirality, where you could see it's the same as its mirror image. Okay, so this is an example, which was introduced by um, Bolstad and Mislow in the 50s. So when you're looking at this picture, the colors have no meaning. So for people who are not used to looking at molecules, I want to explain there are two types of triangles, striped triangles and solid triangles. So for example, this is a striped triangle over here at the far left side. When you have a striped triangle, the base is behind the point. So this red hexagon, you're going to think of it as being behind your computer, whereas the, the triangle is coming forward. So just the point of the triangle is touching your computer screen. On the other hand, when you have a solid triangle like you have below the red hexagon, the base is in front of the point. So here, again, the red hexagon is behind the screen, but now this base of this triangle, this base over here, is in the screen of your computer. And so, and you also see we have a vertical hexagon here, we have a horizontal hexagon here, and so, um, is that a, are you raising your hand? No, you're eating a banana, sorry. Sorry, I was <laughs> eating a banana. <laughs> sorry. I got <laughs> called out, <laughs> which is exactly. fair. Yeah, no, it's okay to eat a banana. So, so what you can see here, in spite of perhaps my not so good three-dimensional drawing, is that this blue hexagon is supposed to be totally horizontal, perpendicular to the screen of your computer, where the triangle in front with the O2n is coming forwards and the striped one is going behind. Um, so this is the molecule we're interested in right now. And what's important about the molecule is that it's completely rigid except for one thing, which is where you see these two orange circles it is rotating simultaneously. Those pieces of the molecule we're going to call propellers because they just rotate together like that. But otherwise, it's completely rigid. And just because I think it's easier to visualize, I'm going to imagine the hexagons with the um, triangles and so on as people. And so that it's a little easier to keep track of um, what's in front and what's behind because people have fronts and backs. And so these two people are behind the screen because the red hexagon and the green hexagon are behind the screen. And they each have these arms that came from the stripe triangle, which is reaching forward where the point of the stripe triangle is in front of the base of the stripe triangle. So the, the, one, the one on the left who has a L on her dress is reaching her left arm forward to hold on to the oxygen, and the one on the right, who is an R on her dress, is reaching her right hand forward to hold on to the oxygen. So that, I think, is a little easier to keep track of than the hexagons, which don't obviously have a front and a back. Okay, so now we should see that, again, the molecule is rigid apart from this rotation, and these individual people on either side are rigid because the molecule is rigid. Furthermore, because she's rigid, the woman on the left always has her left arm forward. The woman on the right always have her right arm forward. And it's actually easy to remember because they only have one arm, each of them, and that's the arm that's forward. So, you know, a, left, a woman with her left arm forward cannot become a woman with her right arm forward. She doesn't have a right arm. Okay, so now we're trying to show this molecule is a, tuple, is a Euclidean rubber glove. So here we have a picture of the molecule together with its mirror image. And for me, the people, myself and Henry, are blocking the right image. I don't know if that's true for the audience. 
Um, but if it's blocking it, you can maybe imagine the rest of it there. So, so for the audience, we can we can uh, click on the window of, of oh. you and drag you around wherever we want. So okay, uh, that's good. So so anyway, so you can see the the molecule and its mirror image, and what you could see is the only difference between the molecule and its mirror image is that the vertical and horizontal hexagons have been interchanged. Okay, because you see in the original picture, which is on the left here, the horizontal one is closer to the mirror, and so the horizontal one is closer to the mirror in its mirror image, but in the one that we started with, it means the horizontal one is on the right near the right-handed woman, and the vertical one is on the left near the left-handed woman, whereas in the mirror image, the horizontal one is on the left near that woman who is left-handed, but she has an R on her dress. Um, so, so you can sort of ignore the, what's on her dress. It's, in fact, the mirror image of that, um, of what's on her dress, which is actually an L. But so in any case, you can see that the vertical and horizontal hexagons of the left image and the right image are reversed. So we want to show this is a, a Euclidean rubber glove, which means that we want to show it's chemically achiral, that is, as a molecule, it can change into its mirror form, but that chemically it can't get into a position which would then become rigidly achiral. So that's, those are the two things we want to show. We're going to do the first one first. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our original molecule, which is like there are lots of them in a test tube, and we're going to rotate it by 90 degrees, which again, as a molecule, you don't have to do anything. They're all sort of swimming around in your test tube, and so they're rotating in a natural way, so we can rotate it by 90 degrees. And, and when we rotate it by 90 degrees, what we see is that the vertical hexagon becomes horizontal, which is what you wanted, and the horizontal hexagon becomes vertical, which is what you wanted, but the two women are now on their backs instead of standing up. That's not what you wanted. So, so the picture that we have at the bottom of the screen now is not the mirror image of the one that we started with. <coughs> Even though, just a second. Even though the horizontal and vertical hexagons are reversed the way we want them to be because the propellers are screwed up. However, in this next slide, we see that, well, the propellers spin. So we can just let them spin, and they'll spin the two horizontal people up to vertical again. And when they do that, we can see that we get exactly the mirror image of what we started with. So this was the molecule we started with. This is the mirror image, which is the same as this. I mean, they have ignoring like the color of their heads and the letters on their dresses, which are not part of the molecule anyway. So, so this shows that, what did we do? We spun the, we rotated the molecule by 90 degrees and then we spun the propellers and all of that is chemically possible. The molecule rotates, the molecule has these propellers that spin and we get the mirror image. So that shows that the molecule is in fact chemically achiral. So now what we want to show is that it can't chemically get into a position which would be exactly the same as its mirror image. So let's see how we would show that. So right now we're going to imagine that it's frozen, it's rigid. So, because we want to know if it could be the same as its mirror image. So I'm going to argue this, freezing it in this position, but you could freeze it when the propellers were in whatever position. The thing to keep in mind is that they rotate simultaneously. So right now, I'm just freezing it in the original position. So, so we have the picture on the left, we have the mirror image, but what we observe in the picture on the left is that the left-handed woman is parallel to the adjacent hexagon, whereas in the mirror, the left-handed woman is perpendicular to the adjacent hexagon. So what we can see is that, well, we remember a left-handed woman can't turn into a right-handed woman, because she only has one hand, okay? And if we're assuming the molecule is rigid, then a pair of parallel hexagons, which we see on the left in red, cannot become a pair of perpendicular hexagons, which we see in green on the right. So that means that as a rigid object, if we freeze it, 
this molecule is going to be different from its mirror image. Hey, Rick, and it yes. I have a yes. clarification question. Yeah. So the um, there's one degree of freedom in how they rotate. So they have to rotate together. together. You don't have two different degrees no. of freedom. No, I we're see. not. We're not doing that. Exactly. Okay. They're rotating together. And and by the way, you can think of it instead, if you want, as the two ends are fixed and the center is rotating, right? And that may be sort of the more realistic way to think of it, rather than these two. How are these two propellers communicating with each other? What they're doing. Um, but it's just sort of more convenient for me in the explanation to think of it as propellers. Okay, but so, so anyway, we saw that if we froze it in this position, we can't get the mirror image as a rigid object. You can freeze it in any position. That is to say, instead of freezing it with the propellers like this, they, you could freeze it with the propellers like this, or like this, or whatever you want. The point is that the angle between the propeller and its adjacent hexagon on the left is going to be different in the mirror image than it is in the original. So we're not going to be able to go from one to the other as a rigid motion. So this shows that this molecule is chemically achiral, but it's chemically impossible for it to attain a position which is rigidly achiral. And when I say it's chemically impossible, what I mean is that the only motion it's allowed to make as a molecule is to rotate the propellers or to move the whole thing rigidly, okay? So we're not allowed to like grab one side and twist it and do all kinds of topological things that we might like to do. So this shows that this particular molecule is a Euclidean rubber glove because it's chemically achiral but can't chemically get into a position which is rigidly achiral. So this is an example uh, that Van Gulik was looking for. Okay, so what we've shown now is that these two definitions are not the same. Henry, do you have another question? I, I did, yeah. So um, my question was, <clears throat> I'm trying to understand just a little bit of the chemistry for, for why you could rotate um, um, the middle joints, but you couldn't rotate the two ends. Is it sort of like, um, I mean, this molecule, its conformation needs to be near to an energy minimizing configuration and so you're near energy minimizing when the when the two people are are parallel and then in the middle you're close to an energy minimizing configuration no matter how it's rotated i think that that's correct but i'm not a chemist so that's my okay best, okay my best yeah guess. no it uh, sounds plausible <laughs> at, at least exactly Thanks. so no problem so so these two definitions rigidly achiral is not equivalent to chemically achiral as we see in this example but in fact, mathematics is never going to be able to completely characterize chemical achirality because rigidity is determined by the chemistry properties, not the geometry. That is to say, we could have another molecule maybe that looks similar to this where there wouldn't be the propellers moving or where the whole thing would be flexible or whatever. So as a mathematician, as a topologist or a geometer, we can't look at the molecule in isolation and be able to characterize its chirality. So, so the definition of rigid achirality is a good approximation because we know if a molecule is rigidly achiral, then it's chemically achiral. Um, but we can't always assume that they're equivalent. Okay, so now we're gonna leave the world of geometry and move to the world of topology. And we know that topology is the study of flexible objects. And so from a topology point of view, we're gonna define a molecule to be topologically achiral if it can be deformed to its mirror image. And otherwise we'll say it's topologically chiral if it cannot be deformed to its mirror image. So this molecule that we were looking at can certainly be deformed to its mirror image. You can actually just twist the horizontal and vertical hexagons to be the way you want them. And so it's topologically achiral. So in this example, topological achirality is closer to what's happening with the molecule than, than rigid achirality is. Okay, but that's not always the case. So, so the bigger molecule is, the more flexible it is, which is why DNA and proteins are quite flexible. If you have a very small molecule like this one, then it has the form actually of a rigid tetrahedron, 
It's chemically chiral, because if you look at it in a mirror image, it's completely rigid. It can't do anything, because the, the groups of atoms on the endpoints are different from one another. But it would be topologically achiral, because from a topology point of view, I could grab the CO2H and the NH2 and just switch them from back to front while leaving them attached to the center carbon, because I can sort of just twist around that vertex of the graph as a topologist. So this shows that we have these implications. So if a molecule is topologically chiral, it means it cannot be, it cannot be deformed to its mirror image no matter how flexible it is, okay, then it will have to be chemically chiral because chemically any motion that's possible for a molecule is some kind of continuous motion. It, a molecule can't have bonds cutting through one another. So, so if it's not possible to deform the molecule to its mirror image, then it won't be possible chemically for the molecule to change into its mirror image. And as we saw already, if it's chemically achiral, a chemically chiral, it certainly won't be rigidly achiral because if it were rigidly achiral, it would be identical to its mirror image. So we have implications left to right here, but these two examples show us that we don't have implications right to left. So the top example was a molecule which is rigidly chiral but chemically achiral, and the bottom one is an example of a molecule which is chemically chiral but topologically achiral. So we don't have the implications going the other direction. Okay, so now David Walba is a chemist who is the person who synthesized the first Mobius ladder, and he, after, after seeing the Euclidean rubber glove could exist, he defined the idea of a topological rubber glove. So a molecule is a topological rubber glove if it's chemically achiral, but now it cannot be deformed to a position which is then rigidly the same as its mirror image. This is different from it being a Euclidean rubber glove, which again, it's chemically achiral, but in this definition of a Euclidean rubber glove, the question is, can it chemically change into a position which is rigidly achiral, versus now we're allowing it to be deformed. So, so an example here is this rubber glove, which we saw is achiral as a physical object. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a Euclidean rubber glove because as, a, I'm gonna use chemically to be the same as physical here. Physically, it cannot get into a position which is the same as its mirror image. However, if I assumed it has arbitrary flexibility, I could just take it and you know flatten it out so it's a disc in the plane and it would be the same as its mirror image. So the glove is a Euclidean rubber glove, but it's not a topological rubber glove. So, um, <clears throat> just a sec. So when David Walba introduced this definition, I think he and most other people thought that no such molecule could exist. Um, because they thought if it's chemically achiral and you totally ignore all constraints in terms of flexibility, you're gonna be able to get it into a nice achiral position where you can see the achirality is a rigid motion. Okay, so first realize that the example we already saw is not a topological rubber glove because this molecule, just like my physical rubber glove, could be, this one could be deformed into the plane, well, so can this. This molecule, I can flatten it out completely into the plane, and then it's gonna be identical to its mirror image. So this is not a topological rubber glove. Okay, so the question is, well, can it exist? Well, it has to be a molecule that can't be deformed into the plane. Because anything with, which is abstractly, or not abstractly, which is in a position that's planar in space, could be deformed into a plane, and then it would be, then you would get it into a position which is identical to its mirror image. So the idea is, well, maybe if we had a knotted or linked molecule, that would work because we know knots and links can't be deformed into a plane. So the first things that come to mind are DNA or proteins because DNA can be knotted and linked, as can proteins, but these are not gonna give us an example because both DNA and proteins contain amino acids and sugars, 
which are all chemically chiral. So we have to start with a molecule which is chemically achiral. So, so using DNA or proteins is not going to work. Okay. So, so before we go on and talk about how this, how this happens, I want to answer Henry's original question, which is why do chemists do these things? Okay, so why do they want to make rubber gloves, knots, links, Mobius ladders, whatever? And the reason is that they declare targets of synthesis. And these targets are things that it is not known how it could be done at the time it was phrased as a target. Kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Hilbert's problems, right? That there's, that someone puts out there a problem that given what we know today, we don't know how to solve it. And the idea is it's supposed to stimulate the chemist to creativity to come up with new methods, which might lead to uh, new drugs that could cure cancer or what have you. And sometimes the targets of synthesis themselves turn out to be useful. Just kind of like in mathematics, how uh, number theory, which was always supposed to be one of the purest forms of math, you know, you have uh, Hardy's uh, mathematical apology, is assuming it has no applications whatsoever, certainly not for war, and then it turns out to be what you need to do cryptography. So the same thing has happened with uh, these kinds of targets of synthesis. So two examples in this picture. One is the idea of a molecular switch. So if you look at the picture on the left with the red and the black rings, what you can see if I make it out of my hands is that it has two positions. I don't know if you can see the two positions with my hands, but you can see them with the red and the black. And that can be thought of as a switch, depending on which direction it is. And those are currently being used to try to create uh, transistors, which are much smaller, which are on the, on the size of a molecule, which would really revolutionize technology. Okay, so I'm not saying they've succeeded, but that's the idea that many people are trying to use. The second picture, which is also a pair of linked rings, is the idea of a molecular motor. So here you see you've got a gray ring, and then you've got a multicolor ring. And the multicolor ring has like a red part, a green part, and a blue part. And what you want to do is create a charge on progressively different parts, which is going to cause the gray ring to move from being on the red part to the green part to the blue part back to the red part. Um, so again, it's not like this is being used to, I don't know, run your car or your telephone or whatever. But again, it's the idea is that we want to have switches, we want to have motors that are at a very, very small level in order to enable all kinds of technology. So this is an example of how linked rings was one of the first targets of synthesis that was actually achieved with no idea that it would actually be ever useful. And now it seems like it could become useful. The other one that's also being used right now is knotted molecules. And what you should think about a knotted molecule is you should think about a sweater. So <clears throat> if you think about a sweater, if you think about wool or cotton or whatever your sweater is made out of, it's not stretchy. Like if you just have a piece of cotton or you just have a piece of wool, it's not stretchy. But by knitting it, it becomes stretchy. So it's all sort of hooked together in a way where it can pull in different ways and it's stretchy. And the same thing is true for knotted molecules. So right now, material scientists are using the idea of knotted molecules to try to get, make materials like this that are stretchy, even though they're not necessarily made out of rubber or something natural like that. So they want to make, for example, one, one thing I think is being currently worked on is, you know, these horrible plastic bags that are polluting our oceans, not to not pollute our oceans, but to make them better, I think material scientists are working on making them more stretchy so that they won't break as easily when something heavy is placed into them. And knotted molecules are one approach to that. So this is all to say that these types of molecules seem way out, why would anyone care about that? But it has these two purposes. One, to try to stimulate chemists to be creative in their techniques of synthesis. 
And two, after it's synthesized, then people can find a use for it. So, and, and that's true in math too. All right, so now let's go back. We want to make a, a, a knot, okay, not out of DNA, that could become a topological rubber glove. And so how do we make a knot? Well, there's sort of two approaches that have been um, done by organic chemists. One is what's called metal template synthesis. And the idea is you use a metal, in this case it's an iron, it's a copper, sorry. In this case it's a copper molecule, in order to hold pieces together while you build them. So, so we take a piece that looks like this thing on the left, we create two of those pieces, we put them in this kind of twisting pattern that you see on the right, and then create this template with the copper and nitrogens that holds them in that position. So it's what's called a scaffolding that holds them in that position. And then we join the ends with these long carbon oxygen chains, which are what you see in the lower picture. And then we remove the template. And then you end up with a knot. Okay, so this, this method, metal template synthesis, has been used to synthesize a number of knots, not a lot, but I'll talk about which ones in a little bit, as well as links. So this has been a very successful approach to synthesizing knots, and it was the first, the first synthetic knot that was ever created was done with this approach. Okay, so what about this particular molecule that we get in that way? It's the trefoil knot, which is the simplest knot. Um, is it a topological rubber glove? And the answer is no, because even as a topological object, that is ignoring all the hexagons and nitrogens and oxygens, we can think of it as the knot that's on the bottom of the screen, and topologically that's distinct from its mirror image. And so, mm, and so the molecule is definitely chemically chiral because it's topologically chiral. We saw that topologically chiral implies chemically chiral. So this is not gonna give us a topological rubber glove. So well, what about other molecules that are knotted? So, oh wait, let me talk about a link. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so this idea of metal template synthesis was actually used to create a link that is a topological rubber glove. So here's the, the link, it was used again with a metal template to hold it in position while the ends were connected. On the left, we have the original. On the right, we have the mirror image. And what you can see is you can go from the left form to the right form by that, that switch that we talked about before, where you have one of the rings turning over. So the bottom ring turns over. But the issue here is that the top ring has a pair of hexagons that are slanted to the right on the original and on the mirror form, the pair of hexagons is slanted to the left. However, just like in the, in the Euclidean rubber glove that we saw that rotated around those particular bonds, this molecule, you can rotate the pair of hexagons at the top around the particular bonds that I have indicated with the orange uh, circles. So that means to get from the original link, which is on the left, to the one on the right, you just turn over the bottom ring, which it does freely, and then you spin, or you allow to spin, the hexagons at the top to get them slanting in the right direction as they are on the right. So this shows that this link is, uh, is a chiral as a molecule. Now we wanna see that it can't get into a position which, uh, sorry, it can't even be deformed to a position which would be rigidly the same as its mirror image. So to do that, let's suppose that somehow it's in such a position, okay? So it, it won't necessarily look the way I've drawn it here, but I want us to see that when it's in this position, you have these two rings and the two, so it's some, in some position which is identical to its mirror image. Okay, well, the two rings are different. So it can't be the case that it's identical to the mirror image by interchanging the two rings, by the, the mirror form would switch the two rings because the one on the bottom has this little H3C which sticks out, the one on the top has a pair of hexagons which the one on the bottom doesn't have. So the two rings are distinct. So if it's going to be put in some position which is rigidly the same as its mirror image, 
then that mirror symmetry still has to take the bottom ring to itself and the top ring to itself. Okay, in addition to that, the bottom ring isn't, it can't have a mirror symmetry of itself. I mean, it can lie in a plane of the mirror, but there's no reflection of that bottom ring because of the fact that I have the H3C sticking out on one side. So if I tried to reflect it, then I would get the H3C would be on the other side. So, so in order for it to be the same as the mirror form, the bottom ring, you would imagine it would have to have two symmetric H3Cs, which we don't have. So this is telling me that whatever position this molecule is in, which is supposedly identical, rigidly identical to its mirror image, the bottom ring has to be somehow in the plane of the reflection because it can't do anything. So the question is, well, what happens to the top ring? Well, the top ring is going to go to itself, which means it's going to switch two halves of it. So that means that however this is positioned in space, <coughs> the mirror must cut the top ring in half. <coughs> okay, however, let's think about what that mirror does. Again, we're not really relying on this particular picture. I'm just using this to illustrate it. The mirror, if it splits these two, uh, these these two halves in half, it would have to take, it would have to cut through it in some way. So it could cut through, so in this picture I've drawn it so that it cuts through the three edges that have black dots on them. We could also make an argument if it were to cut, a, like, so that the plane of the mirror lay along one of the, the edge joining the two hexagons. But what you can see is that either way, if you imagine the mirror as I've drawn it here, you have on the right, that oxygen is coming out of the top hexagon. There's no oxygen coming out of the top hexagon on the left. So it's not the same as its mirror image. And the same thing would happen if you drew the mirror so that it contained that middle, that middle edge that separates the two hexagons. You would have the hexagon on the top would then, I'm imagining a horizontal plane. I would then have an oxygen sticking out to the right Whereas in the mirror image, the oxygen would be sticking out to the left. So it wouldn't be the same as its mirror image. So this molecule, this linked molecule, is indeed a topological rubber glove. And I see that I'm out of time, but let me just see. Um, I want to sort of close with this question, which is it, it's still not known whether there can be a molecular knot, which is a topological rubber glove. And in fact, these are the only knots that have been synthesized with this method. And then later, I always write my talks to be too long. But anyway, later I was going to explain another method which also hasn't yielded a topological rubber glove that's a knot. So we do know such a thing can exist that's a link, but the question is what about as a knot? So I'll stop there for questions. Thank you, Erica. Any questions? <clears throat> Okay, so then I have a question, um, but it's okay. more like historical. I'm just sort of wondering, like, um, uh, you know, like how did you uh, like how did you come across this? It's like, you know, were you in contact with chemists, and you know, they started so, like learning about topology, and like, you know, okay, what's so sort of like the development of the field? I'll, like? tell, I'll tell you my personal story, which maybe I don't know isn't it isn't generalizable. But so, so I got my PhD in 1983 from the University of Wisconsin. I was a knot theorist. And shortly after I got my PhD, I went to an AMS meeting where John Simon from the University of Iowa was talking about his proof that the molecular Mobius ladders are topologically chiral using techniques from knot theory. And I thought that was interesting. I actually didn't know any chemistry. I didn't take chemistry in college. I took it in high school. And at the end of the talk, I asked a question. I can't remember what my question was. He answered the question. The end, I, w I was at a postdoc at that point. I was at Rice University on a postdoc. About a week later, he called me, and he said that he and David Walba, the chemist who synthesized the molecular Mobius ladder, were writing an interdisciplinary grant proposal, and they wanted to know if I wanted to join their project to study topology and chemistry. And I said, I don't know any chemistry. Why are you asking me? <clears throat> and he said, well, we're interested in symmetries. I'd done my PhD on symmetries of knots. 
And you're the only person who asked the question at the end of the talk. So I figured you were the only person who was interested. So, so I said, okay, but you know, don't expect me to know any chemistry. So indeed we got the grant and as a result, he, so he was being invited to chemistry conferences to talk about the topology of molecules. And the way the chemistry world works is that whenever a professor is invited somewhere, then his, it's usually, it was usually a him back in the eighties, but anyway, or her uh, postdocs get invited to do a poster. Okay, well, even though he and I were not in the same university and never had been and didn't even know each other that well, I was now being invited to do posters at these chemistry conferences. <clears throat> so I began going there and I began talking to people, chemists and John Simon Moore and so on. And then he had the misfortune of becoming chair and could no longer go to conferences because he had too much on his plate. Um, and so then when he would tell chemists who would invite him to conferences that he couldn't come, they would say, well, could we invite your postdoc, who was me? So then I got invited to these conferences. And so then I began to learn more. And then like my name sort of got out there in some chemistry world. So people would write to me and ask me, people meaning chemists, would write to me and ask me questions. And that would stimulate me to do some work in that area. So, so throughout my career, I've worked sort of in both worlds, both as a knot theorist and three manifold topologist, purely in the abstract world of pure math, and also working with chemists studying symmetries of molecules. Um, and I did um, some time ago write a book called When Topology Meets Chemistry, um, which was jointly published by the um, uh, MAA and Cambridge University Press. The MAA Press is now taken over by the MS, so now the book is there. But more recently, I wrote an elementary textbook. So that was kind of intended at like the first year graduate students kind of level. Mm -hmm. so, so I wrote an elementary textbook that's uh, called Knots, Molecules, and the Universe, an Introduction to Topology, which is meant to be sort of a combinatorial introduction to topology for first and second year college students with applications in all these different areas. So, so I've sort of continued in that vein, but I also do uh, continue to do work in applications. Most recently, I've been um, studying uh, uh, knotted proteins and doing some work together with Helen Wong uh, on creating models of how proteins knot. So, that's my history. Perfect. Thank you. That's really cool. Uh, so, do we have any other questions? So, uh, I, I have one question. So, uh, okay. I wanted to see if I understand this question on your last slide, Erica. So, um, yes. if we could, if we could synthesize all knots, uh, if we could molecularly create all knots, then the answer to this question would be known to be yes. Is that is that yes. right? Yes. So okay. so yes, that's true. So the knot eight seventeen, which you might not know, I mean, it happens nope. to be a knot that I like, <laughs> but anyway, is the um, it has eight crossings. It's the seventeenth such knot in the tables. Uh, is an example of a topological rubber glove that is is a knot. So huh. it, it, it hasn't been synthesized. These knots, as you right. see, are much smaller. Um, so, it, yeah, so, so in fact, I should, well, uh, yeah, I should say that the, well, no, let's not say that. Anyway, so it hasn't been synthesized, but it would be a topological rubber glove if it were synthesized. Very cool, thanks. Um, perfect. So in case there are uh, no further questions, let's thank Erica again. Um, so we like we usually clap at the end, so please unmute yourself for the clapping part. And <laughs> yeah. thanks, Erica. Thank you. Thank you.